Hebrews, and there are Bibles under the seats too, uh, towards the back of the New Testament, book of Hebrews, chapter 11, I'm going to read Hebrews 11, verse 39, through Hebrews 12, verse 2. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Despising the shame. And is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Blessed is the reading of God's holy, inerrant, infallible gospel word, good news to our hearts and our souls as sinners. Let's pray. Father, I beg that you help me teach. Teach well, be clear, help unpack this that is before us this morning in Hebrews. But more than that, Lord, we need your work by the presence of your Holy Spirit. Plant it deep into our souls, our consciences, our desire factors. And we know this is your joy to glorify yourself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit through that very process of your word going forth. And so do it in Jesus' name. Amen. So here's the writer writing to a group of Christians all been baptized, they come to faith in Christ, many of them for many years. And again, he lets us know right here that for the believer in Jesus, the resurrected, ascended king of the universe, the sovereign, Jesus, is to be the ongoing focus of their lives. In other words, he's telling us how to live as believers. Right there in verse 2, chapter 12. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. That's the Christian life. He tells us the core of what this life is. But then around it, he uses this metaphor. As we are looking to Jesus, what is going on as we walk through this world? And you can see that in the middle of verse 1. Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. That's the main point of this text. You who have come to Christ, you who next week will make your public profession of faith in Christ through baptism, get out of the water and Run the race. That's Christianity. 
It is an endurance race. At the end of his life, the Apostle Paul, old and within weeks or just a few months of his execution by the state, the Roman Empire, he writes to his beloved son in the faith, Pastor Timothy, in 2 Timothy 4, 7, and he summed it up this way. As he knows he's going to depart the body and be with Christ. I have fought the good fight. I, and here's the metaphor, have finished the race. I have kept the faith. So here's the exhortation to us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Because we're breathing and we're alive and we're not yet dead. Streets of Boston still lay before us. The finish line is still ahead of us. Let us run it with endurance. That's what he's saying to us now, getting towards the end of this letter. And, but remember, it's been the context of the, the whole book of Hebrews. Run. You must endure. I mean, your body wants to give out. Your soul wants to give out. Your mind wants to give out. Remember what he said back in chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to the Scripture, to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. How shall we escape? If we neglect such a great salvation, the race of the Christian life is not passive living. It is active, purposeful running. And so he says, run, grow, overflow. And so he says to us now in verse 1 of chapter 12, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. This has been the point of the whole book of Hebrews. Be vigilant, be earnest, endure, persevere, fight of trusting in the promises that Jesus has purchased. That's the whole point of looking to Jesus. It's all based on Jesus, the sacrificial lamb. God took our sins, not physically, but he considered them, that is, imputed them to the only perfect man the creator of the universe, God without beginning, who became a human being, and he slaughtered him there on the cross. Why? Because of our sin, and it's paid for. It is finished. We sang it this morning. It's done. And so, through this life, run. It's a race. And it's filled with struggle like any marathon. Because it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. Run the race set before us. Run with endurance. It means bear up under what may come in that 26.2 mile marathon when your body and your mind want to give out. 
The, the word endure with endurance is the exact same word he uses for Christ right there in chapter 12, verse 2. Christ endured the cross. Because of Christ, we take up our cross and we follow him. And in following him, there will be much to endure. And so the text says, don't quit. Don't coast. Drift away. Keep running. Now, in that run, notice what he tells us. In verse 1 there. He's helping us run. Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. To lay aside means to take off. It's the same word they would use to take off your coat, to take off your clothing. Take it off. What's he saying? Anything, as you're running the marathon, that is going to impede your race, if you got a big coat on and some tight jeans on, take them off and put on shorts and wear no shirt or a tank top or something where you're free to run. Lay aside every weight. The New American translates that encumbrance. It, it's a weight that, that, that is trying to slow you down in, in the race. Uh, just literally recently, I started, because I when my exercise, I walk for like two and a half to three miles kind of fast, and I'm in pretty good shape doing that now, and I read something, well, that makes sense, so I put a backpack on, and I put 15-pound weight, and I could really tell the difference. But if it's a real race and not training, he's saying, take that off. Take it off. You, you will run better. You'll, you'll have more endurance. Every weight that is weighing you down, he says, take it off. Weights and sin. And because the second one is sin, I take that first one. I, I'm pretty sure he means here stuff that's not necessarily sinful in and of itself. Because he'll, 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 secondly, he'll bring in sin. So they're hindrances. So you may say, for instance, movies, they're not sinful. And they're not. I mean, there were denominations or churches in the past that, that almost wrote that in there like a to go to a movie was sinful. Okay, true. So when you conclude, though, therefore, I'm going to watch 15 movies every week. And that's what you do with your life. Hmm, might be a weight, an encumbrance to the Christian race. Sports are good. Wonderful thing. Team camaraderie. Learn how to lose. Learn how to win. They're a joy to watch. They're a joy to participate in it. So sports are good. There's nothing sinful about sports in and of itself. Therefore, I'm going to play softball as a dad raising kids and a husband five or six nights every week along with watching 23 sporting events on ESPN every week. There's my life. Maybe a horrendous hindrance. There are many things that are okay in and of themselves, but the question is, is it hindering my race? Is it helping me or hindering my walk? with Jesus. Often, the problem is not that we have some of these pieces of clothing in our lives. 
but it's that we have too much of it. To when it went over, it has now become a weight. So, for instance, look. At a point, recreation and entertainment, I think, are crucial to the human being. I think they're crucial to the Christian. Recreation, entertainment, rejuvenate us for the race. But then too much begins to become a weight. Starts to slowly harden our souls, harden our hearts, and we drift. He says, lay aside Weights, are they becoming weights? You lay those aside, get balanced back in the next sin. Sin which just easily messes us up. He says, take it off. The command is to run and to lay aside, to take off, put off those things, those, the, the sinning that, that's causing your your mind and your desires to become more and more worldly. Walk by the Spirit, not by the flesh. So, just put them off. <laughs> that, that just doesn't work. That's not how we human beings are, though. You know what? You're 32 pounds overweight. You're in your mid-50s. Uh, lose the weight, you'll live longer, statistically. Just do it. No, we, we, we don't do it. Or do the exercise. We don't do it until we have an incentive, a motive. Do I want to live longer? Do I want to see my grandkids? And, and, and those incentives are before us, and they motivate going through an endurance a, a discipline. And so in this text, he builds around this the incentives to run, to lay these aside and keep laying them aside. That's part of the walk as you're looking to Jesus. And the incentives are the bodily gasoline for the marathon to empower your lungs and your legs to run. So look at the first one. Notice verse 1. It begins with the word, therefore. Therefore, I always ask, why is that there for there for? Because it's reaching backwards to something that he just said. The therefore points back to chapter 11 and all the examples summed up particularly in verses 39 and 40. And because of verses 39 and 40 of chapter 11, therefore, let us run. Hopefully we see it now. Let's read 39 and 40, chapter 11. And all of these examples that he has laid out throughout all chapter 11 of those who ran the fight of faith, and all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Therefore, run. That's the fight. Notice, he said, God has provided something better. So if you're the original Christian, Jewish Christian he's writing to back there in the first century, about 62 AD, he says, he's provided something better for you and for me. And it goes for us today. Something better than what David got. Something better than what Abraham got. Something better than what Daniel and Jeremiah and the prophets got. 
because he says it. They did not receive what was promised. Why did they not receive what God had promised? He answers it right there at the end of verse 40. Because apart from us, Christians on this side of the cross now, they should not be made Apart from us. Okay. Now, if this were inductive Bible study on Monday night, I'd say, what, okay, got, go ahead. What's that mean? What do you think that means? Uh, throw out options that, with the text and its context, is it, wait, does, does it mean this? And, I, and that's what we do. In, instead of, you know, eating fish on Monday night, we, it's more like let's keep practicing fishing. Interpreting Bible. And if you have another one, I, I can only think of one option that makes sense to me here of what he is trying to say. And that is, he's saying all of God's people, from Abel to Noah to Abraham to David to Paul to St. Augustine, to Martin Luther, to Jonathan Edwards, to Mrs. Smith, to that loved one of yours who has now died and is present with the Lord. All of God's people are to come into the fold, the sheepfold, through new birth. Which brings, you know it, because they have faith. They come into faith in, in Christ. All of them are to come in before any of them experience the fullness of the promise. The resurrection of the body and the age to come. That's what I think means. The saints that he laid out throughout chapter 11, Old Testament saints as our, as our examples, all of them finished their race. They died. And they, since then and right now, are in a disembodied state with Christ. Like he'll say in chapter 12, we have come to the assembly of the firstborn enrolled in heaven. That's where they are. A loved one who has died this last year, who was in Jesus, a believer in Jesus, is in that disembodied state. His point is no one, none of God's people gets the glory of the final resurrection until all have finished the race. They will not be made perfect without us. Then in the future, Jesus, he will come back. All of the runners in Christ together will be raised imperishable and come into the perfection of the promised inheritance. All together. See, God has always had a people. He has a people. Many of those people have been born then we're born again by the Spirit, came to faith in Christ, and ran their race, and they died like chapter 11 people. Abraham and Noah, all of them throughout the last 2,000 years, Paul, C.S. Lewis, and Mr. Jones. And then there are many of God's people 
who have not yet been born. They will be. And they will be born again and come to faith in Jesus. And here we are this morning, those of us who love the Lord Jesus, who believe in this gospel. We're in the present as his people. And our finishing the race is part of what history is waiting for. And when it's time, when they've all come in, and all of those have finished their race unto death, and all of those have finished their race because they remained alive at the moment Christ returns, they will all be resurrected from the dead in the eternal age will come in. And so he says to us who are present in this world, in this mortal life now, keep running, run it, be motivated by those, here's his point, be motivated by those who have gone before you. That's what verse 12, 1 is saying. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, therefore, let us run. These cloud of witnesses are the believers of chapter 11 and many others. They are those who have already lived their life of faith, persevered to the end and died in faith. And he says, because we have them as, as, as witnesses, therefore, run, persevere, endure. You see it? A nod, I got a nod. Okay, so in what sense? Are they witnesses? He's using it as a motivation. Now that word there from the Greek and translated into English and in both, that word can mean either they are watching us from heaven or that they are those who are witnessing to us by their lives. The word is the word marturo. You can hear it, right? To be a witness. We hear this in the beginning of the book of Acts. And this is where we get the word martyr, where they testified of their faith because they would not deny Jesus and at, 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 at the threat of death. And they gave their lives up in, in death. They're martyrs or witnesses. So that's. The word, it can mean either to witness seeing something or it can mean the act of telling something. That's why we use it as Christians, street witnesses. Go to the evangelism table and go to the university and the whole point is not just to sit there and watch people and witness them. It doesn't mean that. It means we're there to tell them the gospel to bear witness to the gospel. So based on this context, I am persuaded. What he means here is the act of telling. That is, the lies of these saints in chapter 11 are witnessing to us. They're saying by their lives, we did it by God's grace. Therefore, you'll make it run. So, so when he says there in verse 1, chapter 12, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, he means they're there, they're near enough for us to see, to watch them as we run our race. How? It's what he's been doing with his readers. They have the same Old Testament book of writers that he's appealing to throughout chapter 11. And he said, here they are. Listen to their testimony. Here's their witness. Look to them to strengthen your endurance. The Bible surrounds us with them. 
And so it's like we're, we're running the race through the streets in the marathon. And standing on the sidewalks are many who have gone before us. And their testimony is, we finished it. At times we didn't think we could, but the Lord got us through. You can make it. You will make it by the same grace of God. That's his point. Abel, he's part of that cloud of witnesses, right? At the beginning of chapter 11. Abel, killed by his brother. He is telling us something. He is witnessing to us. Look how the writer said it in verse 4 of chapter 11. And through Abel's faith, though he died, he still is witnessing to us. Oh, he didn't use the word witnessing there. He used the word. He still speaks. He's testifying. Oh, how important those biblical stories are to be for our run. So then, we got the testimonies. Now, as we're running, what is the main thing we're doing? Well, it's where we start. Verse 2. They're all encouraging us to run the race. That's the metaphor. Well, what is it really? It is looking to Jesus, the founder, perfecter of our faith. Looking away from distractions that would cause your gaze not to focus on Jesus the creator of the universe, who became a human being just like us, except without sin nature, and endured. And he's going to see, you can see it in a minute. And he talked about endurance. Went to the cross willingly and endured. Look to him and run. And it might be very easy to conclude that the command to run the race, our obeying that and running depends totally, decisively, ultimately on us. And that would be a horrible mistake in how you live. And it would be a wrong interpretation of this text because the writer clarifies something for us. Looking to Jesus, here's who Jesus is, the founder, the, the author, and the perfecter of our faith. He authored it by purchasing our faith on the cross. We have it, if we have it, because he gave it to us. He founded it in us. And if he founded it in you, then he will sustain that faith to the end. Of your race. You remember how Paul said it in the beginning of Philippians? He who began, he began it, not us, he who began a good work in us will perfect it, will bring it to completion at the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Or in chapter 2 of Philippians, he, where Paul says in his, here's how Paul says, run with endurance. He put it this way, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Run. He's not done yet. And then he said, because. Why run? Because look, it's God 
who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Jesus is the author of our faith. He's the one who will sustain it to the end. Look to Jesus in the army. And one last thing that the author gives us here that's key in the marathon. It's key to endure when everything within you at times in that marathon says, I just gonna, I have to quit. I can't make it anymore. My body is doing weird things. I gotta push through. And Jesus, in his humanity, is our example. And the example that he gives is that. Joy, not giddiness, not fake smile, but a deep down joy that is predominantly connected to the future. There's joy there. There's a joy unimaginable there. These are the promises of the gospel in the resurrection. It's there is the power, that joy we see there. The power for each step during the marathon. It's the power or the, it's the barometer of where our faith is at the moment. Let's read it, verse 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, in front of him, for that joy, he endured the cross, despising the shame. And he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. His point is that we are to pursue being like Jesus, he endured the mockery and the spittle, the whip and the punches and the nails and the torture of going up and down for hours on end on a Roman cross. Why? What caused him to endure? It says clearly the joy that was on the other side of that cross. And so we should endure hardships when they come in the race of faith for and by the power of the joy that is set before us. See, Jesus, he knew the torture, any of the experience of the cross was utterly unwelcomed by him in and of itself. Father, if there's any other way, there wasn't. But in going to the cross and bearing the punishment of God against our sins, the sins of others, not his own, he knew he would be raised from the dead in his humanity. And he knew he would ascend on high as sovereign. And he knew he would return one day to raise from the dead to everlasting joy all whom he's purchased by that cross. And that joy is what empowered him to go through the crucifixion. And we believers are to know what he purchased. We are to know those promises of the gospel of the future that are laid up in heaven as an inheritance, undefiled, kept there. We're to know them so intimately that they are the fuel of our lives now. When you know I need endurance here, I need strength here, 
That's the endurance to get through the shame of Satan using our country and the doctrines that are out there. Say, you believe the Bible, all of it, on everything like sex and male and female, and that Jesus is God who became a human being and died for you, and unless you repent, there is an everlasting torment? Yes. That joy, no matter how much they shamed Jesus and mocked him or will shame you, as we read earlier this morning in this service, Jesus said that all the nations will hate you because of my name. That's the joy of the gospel that empowers the present walk and run now. So what do we do? Same thing every week. Just go on. Looking to Jesus. Hanging out prayerfully with Jesus. Communing with Jesus. Considering Jesus in his own struggles in true humanity, tempted in all things as we are. And let the promises of the gospel put into perspective your race. No matter what pain or disease or how your body is feeling on mile 21 of a 26.2 mile race, daily find your empowerment to continue by the power of the Holy Spirit looking to Jesus. He went before you. He has been raised from the dead and ever lives to make intercession for you as he's seated at the right hand of God. And so I close with the words of our text. So let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before For him endured the cross, despising the shame. And he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We know that you're not present here in your resurrection body, but you're ever present. In the Holy Spirit. And Father, on this Father's Day, we thank you. We thank you with the words of Paul for not sparing your own son, but sending him and giving him up to endure the cross for all who would believe.